next talk for the day is uh, hints from hardware security for solving real world challenges by Sergey. Uh, he did speak as our keynote speaker a couple of years ago where he spoke about NAND mirroring attack on iPhone 5C. This is a picture I just wanted to share it because I was really uh, amazed by his research. So yeah, Sergey, the stage is yours right now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, there's no, no video of me because I'm presenting on uh, the mobile phone. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to run uh, Zoom on a uh, normal computer. Um, my talk will be about uh, things we can learn from hardware security for solving real world challenges. So I will start the introduction to hardware security, then um, I will discuss what uh, uh, help we can get in challenging time from uh, either from direct help from hardware security, what things we can do to improve, and indirect help, what kind of encouragement and ideas we can get from hardware security, and what uh, challenges we can face to, to solve, and what workarounds we can come up with. And then I will talk about future work before concluding. So, Hardware security is important because it protects data and intellectual property. It's important for cybersecurity and preventing attacks on services. Uh, there is a need for countermeasures against all known attacks. And there's obviously always increasing, increasing uh, requirements to educate hardware engineers so that the hardware they design is secure. So hardware security is about finding flaws and fixing them. So you have to evaluate the existing security features and then improve them. Uh, but in the past, hardware security faced a lot of challenges. First, uh, there are new attack technologies that uh, always appear and modern fabrication process makes um, attacking modern chips quite challenging. The uh, uh, state of the art being seven nanometers and um, most secure devices are somewhere between 28 and 40 nanometer process. And usually you have to develop countermeasures through understanding of flaws. And that means you have to uh, know how to attack the chips, how to analyze them. And ideally hardware engineers would like to predict new attack methods. The main question is what can else we learn from hardware security? Can we use the the knowledge and approaches that are generated by hardware security. Uh, just a quick introduction on my background. So I'm a senior researcher at the University of Cambridge and I do hardware security research, mainly attack technologies since uh, 1995. I test various microcontrollers, smart cards, FPGA system on chips for security. And I have a broad knowledge from chemistry and electronics to physics and computer science. Um, what is important for building the knowledge is the strong track record of new and uh, sometimes impossible attack methods. So in old days, I was mainly doing non-invasive attacks like clock glitching and power glitching. And then the discovery of optical hope injection attacks uh, brought a, a lot of attention from the industry to my research and also approved, uh, for example, data remnants uh, for EEPROM and flash memory, which normally was a uh, case for SRAM and magnetic media. And then I introduced combined attacks and I used optical emission to complement power analysis. And then uh, there were some other tricks I used to extract the data from memory like bumping attacks and hardware accelerators. And another important, impossible thing I presented was a NANT mirroring and that was uh, presented uh, a few years ago at Hardby IO conference. And then I showed that uh, electron microscopy can not only be used to image mass chrome, but also EEPROM and flash. And also I presented how microprobing can be used for data extraction. And I also showed that the uh, decapsulation of nitric acid can be used on uh, battery powered chips. And I will discuss some of this uh, attacks in details late in my talk. But first I would like to 
talk a bit more um, about challenges hardware security is facing in the, the current situation with the lockdown. So hardware security usually deals with physical devices and some devices are not always small and uh, sample preparation is sometimes a messy process. It involves chemicals and large machineries and experimental setup would be quite bulky if you do some optical fault injection and that requires special environment and that's not always possible to reconstruct at home. But also hardware security could still help with solving certain challenges. Uh, for example, authentication against unauthorized counterfeit devices became quite important because the supply chain security is a big issue when uh, you have a disrupted uh, supply chain. And sometimes if you can't get the right components, you have to uh, find some alternatives. And uh, in order to use uh, alternative solutions, you, you have to somehow find temporary solution for authorized authentication. And after that, you, you can build compatible products for if the normal supply is struggling. And again, hardware security can help with that. And also hardware security could encourage research in other areas. That means finding workarounds if obstacles I encountered, bring innovations to new approaches and even impossible methods. And sometimes you can come up with crazy ideas. So the main question is what can we possibly learn from hardware security and what approaches we can use. So, as I mentioned, there are some direct methods that can be used to help with the existing situation with uh, authentication of devices. From the defense side, you can prevent counterfeit products uh, to enter in uh, your market by improving hardware security, by applying various uh, tests and measurements. But also from the attack point of view, you might want to allow legitimate ways of bypassing protection in case of the disrupted supply so you can use some alternative and compatible products. And for that, normally three attack methods are used, either invasive attacks, which are usually expensive and uh, require quite a long time to succeed. And that involves silicon deprocessing and reverse engineering, microprobing, chip modification. But on the medium cost side, uh, you can use semi-invasive attacks like optical imaging and emission analysis, optical fault injection, at, at low cost side, you can use non-invasive non attacks, which are also quite quick to implement. And that involves brute forcing, side channel, eavesdropping, timing, power, and electromagnetic analysis, power glitching, electromagnetic fault injection, or data remnants. And now we'll talk more in, about indirect methods. What can we learn from different uh, attack techniques and, and uh, successful attacks? Uh, to see how they change the perception and, and what uh, lessons we, we can learn. So if we have a challenge of bypassing code and data protection in microcontrollers, and the purpose for that could be detection and analysis of counterfeit products, compatibility purposes to develop alternative solutions, or even for teaching and training, the solutions could be either fault injection, the power glitching, and, and that was used in the early 90s, and that was later improved with bipolar glitching. So the idea is not only you can increase the power supply or drop the power supply, but you can go below the uh, ground line into the negative rail, and that demonstrated uh, some advantages for defeating data remnants. So uh, SRAM and flip-flops have some undocumented features that if you uh, reduce the, sorry, if you reduce the power supply below the ground level, then uh, in your uh, uh, remaining information from the memory cell disappears very quickly. And that happens, uh, several orders of magnitude faster than just switching off the power supply. Another challenge could be to disrupt a normal device operation and that could be used to inject false into cryptographic operations to extract the key 
take control over the device or bypass security protection mechanisms. The solution for that was uh, introduced in early 2000s with optical fault injection attacks, the laser beam that can be precisely focused at, at a particular memory cell or a particular transistor. And for that, an uh, optical microscope is normally used. And then you can see where you actually focus the laser. So the lessons that could be learned from this is you can exploit the unusual features of uh, MOSFET transistors, in particular, the sensitivity to the light. Another challenge that was also faced uh, is the to recover the data from erased memory. That could sound uh, an impossible task, but could be useful for information recovery and forensic analysis. And actually the solution came with uh, the data remnants effect that uh, I proved exists for uh, EEPROM and flash memory. So even after the memory cell was erased, there's still some remaining charge and that charge can be extracted with different techniques. So ob obviously the lesson is the memory transistor do not uh, lose all the charge uh, for good, but can, uh, can st still be, uh, th th this charge can be recovered and then the information could be restored. Uh, another way to find the more information about the devices and the recover the data uh, could be in, in using combined attacks. So even if uh, each, uh, for example, power analysis or separately fault injection attacks cannot bring you much uh, success, if you combine both attacks, then uh, the, uh, this could br bring much more uh, information or bring you to, to the success and that I introduced back in 2006, and that shows how combined attacks are much, much more powerful than each attack separately. And another challenge uh, was uh, when uh, some devices uh, by design do not contain any readback function because manufacturers uh, decided that it's not a good idea to allow uh, any way of reading back the data, the only uh, thing they offer is to verify the, uh, the external string, like uh, memory contents or the firmware to be verified internally by the de device, and then you only get yes or no response. But obviously the uh, amount of data you supply to the devices is quite large, so that could be hundreds of bytes, and then it's not, feasible to brute force the correct uh, combination of data. But what I proved with bumping attacks is you can mask certain number of bytes, except a very short number, ideally just one byte, and then brute force it, and then uh, move to the next byte. Or you can do it e even further bit by bit, and because each uh, bit in, in, inside the, the actual chip has a different timing until it reaches the uh, the ledge that stores the data. And if you carefully adjust the timing, then you can uh, get only a certain number of bits to, to the ledge. And that way, brute force search becomes much faster. So the lesson is that the, the information leaks even if you have a single yes, no status for a long string of data. And then uh, I also, uh, managed to bypass the passcode protection in iPhone uh, that created a, a lot of uh, media coverage. And they, uh, the task was to increase the number of passcode entries and attempts. And that's important for forensic analysis of devices. And even the, the research was um, uh, encouraged by the comment from FBI director claiming that th this attack is not possible and only software-based solution will work. But then uh, after a few months of uh, experimenting with the iPhone and uh, memory copy, I managed to do the, the hardware mirroring attacks on iPhone 5C and that was presented um, four years ago at Hardware I.O. conference. And 
So the, the lesson from uh, this at attack is that uh, walkarounds could sometime work. Y you have to uh, just try them. And in, in another change that I uh, solved was recovering data from flash and EEPROM memory. This uh, data recovery from flash and EEPROM is much more harder than from MASCROM. And the also this, this type of memory usually stores uh, important uh, information like uh, passwords and keys, and that's important for forensic analysis. And the solution we found was the uh, special mode of electron microscopy called passive voltage contrast that allows you to see the different charge on the surface of the chip. And this is much more efficient and faster than uh, previously existing ex existed methods of by using atomic force microscopy in scanning probe mode, because you no longer have the physical contact and you don't have, have to mechanically scan across the chip. And uh, the lesson from uh, this uh, technique tells us that the old uh, methods like electron microscopy can be used for other purposes rather than just imaging the um, landscape of the chip surface. And another crazy attempt I, I tried to do is uh, to recover the data from a battery backed embedded SRAM. So, normally, if you have a secure devices used in um, some sensitive applications, that uh, then they use uh, an external battery and, and they store the keys inside SRAM. If the SRAM is in separate chip, that's uh, relatively easy to defeat. You have to reconnect the memory. But if you have uh, SRAM in, inside the silicon chip as part of the microcontroller, a secure chip that's uh, much harder to attack, even getting to the chip surface is quite challenging. And uh, for many years, people uh, assumed that it's not safe to use chemicals to, uh, uh, to decapsulate the chip and get to the chip surface. And then I just tried to use 100% nitric acid, and it turned out that uh, uh, at that concentration, nitric acid is not a good conductor, so it doesn't short the, the power supply from the battery. And the lesson from that is sometimes crazy ideas do work. <laughs> so the, the, the next challenge uh, I, I, I took was to use um, um, sample preparation in the uh, ch challenging uh, environment like a lockdown. So, as you can imagine, the physical samples are essential for hardware security, uh, especially semi-invasive methods require access to die surface. And that became much more difficult during the lockdown because uh, uh, sample preparation is a very messy process. It requires chemicals, they are quite dangerous, and uh, also large machinery are also required. And to solve that, that problem, you would have to use some different approaches. So the main reason you would uh, like to use um, some affordable techniques for, sem for semi-invasive attacks is, for example, UV attacks can be used to uh, erase part of the uh, on-chip memory. Usually, partial chip decap decapsulation is used to uh, open up the area above the die and and, and still keep the chip uh, fully connected to the uh, outside pins so you can run the chip under the microscope and inject uh, any fault or you can expose the chip to UV light and then put it back in, into the program and read out the memory. And usually decapsulation starts with uh, mechanical milling of the small cavity on the surface. Then you place the chip on a hot plate under fume cupboard and then you drop put few drops of uh, fuming nitric acid uh, to the, onto this uh, cavity. And after several seconds, you washed it with acetone. And obviously, the, because this process produces lots of uh, nitrous oxides, you, you must do it under fume cupboard. And then you repeat that process until the uh, required part of the dye is exposed. And then you clean the sample in ultrasonic bath and uh, dry it with compressed air. Uh, unfortunately, this process is not 
compatible with chips that use copper bonding wires because copper will react with nitric acid and uh, you lose all the bonding wires. So obviously, uh, if you want to replicate this process without any chemicals, then you still have some options. You, you can use mechanical milling with precision CNC machines, or you can use laser ablation with uh, followed by the microwave-induced plasma etching. But both methods require very expensive tools, and, and those tools are quite large. Uh, so they're not suitable for home use, uh, although they uh, do not in involve any chemicals. So the question is, is it possible to do decapsulation without those tools, which are more affordable in price and easy to perform? So as a target for my experiments, I, I chose uh, flow and peak microcontroller. It was fabricated with relatively old process, and that's the reason why it's uh, sensitive, sensitive to UV light. So you can uh, easily get the samples. You, the chips are fully documented, and it's easy to verify the result of UV exposure by reading out the flash and EEPROM and fuses in the programmer. And I decided to use pure mechanical approach so that no chemicals are involved, only organic solvents. And the most expensive tool I used was the simple polishing machine that cost about $2,000. But alternatively, you can use any uh, rotating platen with uh, sandpaper. And also this process would be safe for copper bonding wires. So for mechanical de decapsulation, I started the process uh, of grinding from the top side of the chip. That's where the front of the die is uh, located. So first I used the sandpaper with the large grid, P400, P600, until I reached the area of bonding wires. So you can see them on the first picture. And then I continued with the medium grid sandpaper until the uh, uh, shape of the die is visible. So you can see from the second to the third picture, you can now see the where the actual die is located. And then I finished the process with the fine sandpaper until the, unfortunately, only part of the die was exposed because it, it was not easy to maintain the planarity of the chip. So the one part of the die was uh, already exposed while the other part was uh, still covered by the thin layer of the package. But that wasn't uh, sufficient for the, the testing experiments. Uh, the question is still but what the, what happens to the bonding wires? Well, they, they're gone by that time, but don't worry. Bonding parts uh, could, were also polished away and some passivation layer was scratched, but again, th that's okay. The question is, is it possible to restore the bonding wires? Um, again, you can use expensive wire bonding machines to do the job. Um, but they require the bonding parts on the die to be clean and not damaged. And also you need some kind of external frame to be available to, to which to bond those wires. And those machines are expensive, are expensive and, and bulky. The question is what else can be used in uh, the restricted environment? Is it possible to solder to the remaining bits? Well, it's, it's not because they're too small, about 20 micrometers at most. Uh, or maybe some kind of conductive glue can be used. And that's what I was trying to do. I tried uh, conductive epoxy that didn't work because it, it didn't stick very well because of uh, very low viscosity. And th there are some PCB trace repair paste and that again didn't work because it was too thick. And then finally I found that the conductive paint box, box just right. So the bonding wire restore process looks like the following. So you first have to find the uh, correct wires like power supply and ground pins. And then I use the template cut from the masking tape. And then uh, once I applied it to the right place and I make sure under the microscope that uh, I, uh, the, the correct bits I, I uh, exposed, then I fill the gap with the conductive paint, let it dry and remove the template. 
So on, on the last picture, you can see the result, but that's only for power supply and ground pins. And then I repeated the process for the remaining three pins that are required for the peak microcontroller to be connected to the programmer. So I, again, I apply the template to mask everything but the required uh, three pins. And then after uh, drying it up and removing, you can see the result on the last picture. And then uh, I put it in, into the programmer and that works uh, pretty well. And you can see the result. It doesn't require any dangerous chemicals. It's affordable and it's uh, safe to, to be carried out at home. And if you end up with fully functional chip that you can then use for uh, optical fault injection attacks or for UV exposure. And that you even worked with the dye being, being polished at an angle. So even if uh, some of the um, bonding pads were polished away, there's still some uh, connections to the uh, bonding pads on, on the side and that uh, created an enough connection to the um, conductive paint. There are some limitations to these methods, especially if you have uh, packages with multiple pins uh, like BGA and if the size of the package is too small, that would be very hard to apply the templates um, because of the small gap between pins. But usually programming and debugging do not require many pins. There are interfaces with just only one um, additional pin to the power required. Some require two pins and uh, at most there are four pins required. And also mechanical stability is quite important, but that can be improved with adhesive and fillers. So for future work, I'm still trying to address various uh, real world problems with uh, those approaches I learned from hardware security, like uh, counterfeiting, um, like detecting counterfeit devices, uh, like uh, helping with developing compatible solutions. Um, also, because of the challenges with equipment access, we had to think about uh, alternative solutions for imaging, like uh, coming up with a very cheap confocal microscope solutions, like uh, also measurement solutions where we have to measure the thickness of uh, silicon with uh, affordable interferometers. And you always have to come up with innovations, improvisations and out of the box thinking. Um, we're trying to collaborate with industry to bring new ideas and to get funding to um, test in various state of the art and beyond ideas. And with the new horizons, it, you have to think uh, 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 innovatively how hardware security can be used to solve other problems. So for example, uh, hardware security relies on the fabrication of semiconductors and that relies on chemistry and chemistry could be useful to solve other real world problems like uh, energy diseases, ecology. For example, batteries, they require chemistry. And th at the same time, if you find the correct uh, solutions in chemistry, you can influence the capacity and charging time and safety of the batteries. And the same with diseases because <clears throat> they affect life cells, but in the same way, chemistry can be used uh, to influence that. And then if you can find new boundaries to uh, find new uh, chemical reactions and new ways of performing chemical reactions, that could help solve those problems. So to con conclude, hardware security relies on innovative approach and out of the box thinking. It can help solving various uh, counterfeit and supply chain related uh, uh, challenges. And uh, the same way real world problems could be solved in innovative way, the hints from hardware security. And the good thing from the lockdown, it, it gives you time to stop and look back uh, and overview the long uh, research you performed and if uh, scrupulous analysis, and that allows you to come up with new approaches and uh, uh, to fight modern challenges and find new solutions. Um, so the important questions to ask, can hardware security solve all the problems? So probably not directly, 
but it, because it relies on chemistry, my feeling is that the chemistry is likely to offer solutions to many challenges. And thank you for your attention. And if you uh, want to ask me privately any questions, you're welcome to uh, send me uh, an email. <laughs>